Good afternoon. This is Nancy Archibald from the Integrated Care Resource Center, or ICRC. Thank you all for joining today's webinar, Perspectives on Ombudsman Programs Serving Duly Eligible Individuals, Services Offered and Value Added. Next slide, please. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly go over a few logistics. For those of you who are joining us by phone, you can view the slides if you log into Zoom, and you'll find the instructions for doing that in your appointment for today's webinar. We've posted a link to the slide deck in the chat box uh, if you would like to download a copy. And uh, also to eliminate background noise, your phone lines have been muted and we'll keep them muted during the presentation today. We will have a Q&A segment at the end of the webinar, uh, but again, the phone lines will be muted. So you can just submit your questions via Zoom's Q&A feature, which is uh, in an icon down at the bottom of your screen. And you can submit those questions in at any point during the webinar. As usual, we'll be recording today's call so that you can revisit uh, the, today's presentation or share the recording with colleagues who were unable to join us. And finally, as you leave the webinar, a short evaluation will pop up on your screen and we'd just appreciate it if you would take a few minutes to share your feedback with us. Next slide. Today, our, print, our presenters will be Teresa Teeple, who is with the Office of the Long-Term Care Ombudsman in Ohio, Jack Daly from the Legal Aid Society of San Diego, Melinda Elwood from Mass Health in Massachusetts, and Dustin Welch from South Carolina's Department of Health and Human Services. Next slide. I'm going to start us off with a quick overview of demonstration ombudsman program structures, services, and the value these programs provide to consumers, states, and health plans. Then Teresa and Jack will talk about how their demonstration ombudsman programs are structured, the benefits of that structure for their state, and if that poses any challenges to them. Um, they'll also talk about the range of activities that the ombudsman engages to support their demonstrations. Finally, we'll get Melinda and Dustin's perspectives on the value of ombudsman programs to state Medicaid agencies and hear a little bit more about their experiences with ombudsman programs. And after that, we should have a couple of minutes left to take your questions. So let's dive in. Uh, next slide, please. So ombudsman programs are an important part of Medicaid managed care programs, particularly those serving people who are duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid or other vulnerable Medicaid populations. And at ICRC, we wanted to better understand how the demonstrations operating under the Financial Alignment Initiative and particularly the capitated models that serve enrollees through Medicare Medicaid plans, or uh, the MMPs, how they were using ombudsman programs, which were a required component of the demonstrations. So we interviewed uh, staff members from the Medicaid agencies and the demonstration ombudsman programs in four states, uh, California, Massachusetts, Ohio, and South Carolina. And we asked them about how their programs were structured, what services were offered, the value the ombudsman programs had for demonstration enrollees and state Medicaid agencies, and if there were any key lessons from these programs that could be applied to Medicaid managed care programs more broadly. We've written up uh, our findings from that research in a new ICRC brief that will also be released today, and I'll provide a link to that at the end of the webinar. But I wanted to briefly talk about what we learned to give you some context for what our presenters will be describing. Next slide, please. First, let's look at how the demonstration ombudsman programs are structured. And we found that the states used two types of structures, either leveraging internal 
state government agencies or departments or contracting with nonprofit organizations. Um, Ohio and South Carolina both created their demonstration ombudsman programs using existing long-term care ombudsman programs located within their state departments of aging. In contrast, California and Massachusetts chose to contract with nonprofit organizations. Both these approaches have some potential advantages and disadvantages. For example, creating an ombudsman program within an existing state agency might allow a state to make use of existing staff, infrastructure, information systems, but it could be potentially challenging if the state has a hiring freeze that would prohibit bringing on new people to staff the office. On the other hand, if your state contracts with a nonprofit to operate an ombudsman program, it might help you to gain stakeholder trust, but you might have to build in extra firewalls to address any potential conflicts of interest between the ombudsman's, the organization's role as an ombudsman and their role as a consumer advocate. And the structure that a state chooses will likely depend on its particular environment and needs. Next slide. Ombudsman programs engage in a range of activities to serve demonstration enrollees and to assist state Medicaid agencies and the Medicare Medicaid plans. And these activities include addressing beneficiary complaints and appeals, tracking and communicating uh, trend data, participating in state and health plan stakeholder committees, conducting beneficiary education and outreach, providing input on program design or early implementation, and referring beneficiaries to community services. Next slide. So, the demonstration ombudsman programs provided uh, a number of valuable uh, value-based uh, services for, for the demos. So they were seen as a neutral third party, which allowed the ombudsman to create bridges between the various stakeholders involved in the demonstrations and to foster communication among them. They're also, boots on the ground, so having direct contact with beneficiaries oftentimes allows the ombudsman to resolve an individual's concerns without having to elevate an issue up to the state where it would become a complaint or an appeal. And that frees up state resources for other operational and oversight activities. Also, having direct contact with beneficiaries allows the ombudsman to assist with outreach and education, and they can also sometimes help locate individuals who are hard to reach. The ombudsman were also seen as the beneficiary's voice. Oftentimes, they're the only group at the administrative table, so to speak, that's solely dedicated to representing the consumer's interest. And the ombudsman also can function as an early warning system. Their ability to track and trend data allows the ombudsman to alert the state and health plans of potential problems with the demonstration's operation. Next slide. So a few key lessons that we, we pulled from our, our interviews with the state Medicaid agencies and the ombudsman staff. And really, so for ombudsman programs, uh, our interviewees felt that it was important for the ombudsman to have experience serving the population uh, targeted or enrolled by the demonstration. And also for the ombudsman staff to reflect the diversity of the population being served. Um, it's also really important for this duly eligible uh, enrollee population that the ombudsman have deep knowledge of both Medicare and Medicaid. And also the ability to build relationships among stakeholders. Uh, two key uh, lessons for states was that um, they need to clearly communicate the ombudsman role 
to the larger stakeholder audience so that health plans and beneficiaries and other uh, beneficiary advocacy organizations really understand what the ombudsman is there to do. And uh, for states that are using uh, uh, a nonprofit organization to run their ombudsman program, it's also uh, important that the state build some firewalls, as we said, between the ombudsman function and the advocacy function of that organization. So uh, with that background, I'm gonna turn it over to Teresa Teeples from Ohio, who's going to give us a bit of perspective on their program. Teresa? Great, thank you, Nancy. Uh, hi all, I'm Teresa Teeple, Ombudsman Systems Liaison with the Ohio Office of the State Long-Term Care Ombudsman. Um, so over the next few minutes, I'll be sharing with you uh, the model through which we provide ombudsman services in Ohio uh, with a particular focus on serving folks in My Care Ohio, our demonstration. I'll also talk about some of what we believe to be our value adds to My Care, um, the benefits of our structure, and some of the learning curves associated uh, with our structure as well. Um, so next slide, slide please. Uh, next slide. Okay, great. So um, I'll start here by talking about our authority and the structure of our office. The Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program uh, was established by the Federal Older Americans Act and became a requirement of states in 1978. It began as the Nursing Home Ombudsman Program, but quickly grew to include boarding care homes uh, and also got a name change along the way to the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program. Through state law enhancement here in Ohio, the ombudsman program also assumed the role of uh, providing services to folks receiving care at home. And we're about um, one of a dozen states or so that have this added authority. This includes services such as case management, personal care, homemaker, chore services, home delivered meals, those sorts of things. We also provide services to folks in um, nursing homes and assisted living facilities and smaller group homes. And then in 2014, we began providing services to MyCare Ohio consumers, and our role um, is briefly outlined in the three-way contract between the Ohio Department of Medicaid, CMS, and our MyCare plans. Our office is housed within the Ohio Department of Aging, uh, but operates as a separate and distinct entity as is required by the Older Americans Act. We designate what we call sponsoring agencies that um, host our regional ombudsman programs across the state. And um, these can be found in different settings, area agencies on aging, um, a couple of legal service providers some community-based organizations. And then our largest program is a standalone nonprofit in the Cleveland metro area. So all said, we have about 80 paid staff statewide and a growing core of um, volunteers, currently around 230 volunteers. Um, next slide. All right, so very quickly, MyCare Ohio includes those services traditionally covered by Medicare and Medicaid, including uh, long-term services and supports and behavioral health. It's offered in 29 of 88 Ohio counties, those surrounding our major metropolitan regions. Individuals in our demonstration can only opt out of the Medicare side. So managed Medicaid is mandatory for folks who are otherwise eligible. Um, there are around 130,000 MyCare members, give or take. About a quarter of them are receiving a waiver service. Another 14% are living in a nursing home long-term. And the rest, around 62%, are what we call community well. Next slide. Before I jump in here um, and talk about our role in MyCare, I'll share that MyCare work is just a small piece of what we do within the broader office. Uh, so in federal fiscal year 19, our office handled around 8,000 long-term care complaints statewide. Generally speaking, we address around 400 additional MyCare complaints annually. And so when a complaint is about MyCare Ohio or a MyCare plan or provider, we consider that to be a MyCare complaint. We provide services to all MyCare members, those in facilities or at home, um, those that maybe just are using their benefits for prescriptions, doctor visits, other acute care needs. Um, and most of our MyCare complaints come from members receiving services at home. 
So, all right, what do we do? Um, first, we respond to inquiries or questions from consumers and lots of other folks about really everything from eligibility and enrollment to um, how to find a provider on a particular plan's website to, you know, what should I expect from my care manager? We also attend those plan-hosted member advisory meetings quarterly, and these are required of plans, but really with the goal of creating a kind of a direct feedback loop from members to plans that, um, that impact care. We attend uh, basically to share information about our role, answer questions, and ensure that consumers are having their questions answered and their needs met um, that are brought up in those forums. We do a lot of education, um, so we've participated in over 650 community education events to date where we share information about MyCare. Um, ombudsmen provide information and data on trending issues with the demonstration, both directly to plans and to other stakeholders such as CMS and the Department of Medicaid. Uh, we make recommendations based on these trends and our observations of ways to make MyCare better for consumers. And then finally, and maybe most importantly, um, most of an ombudsman's time in my care is spent investigating and working to resolve complaints, consumer complaints. Investigation includes getting informed consent from the consumer, our client, working with plans and providers to gather information, and then working to resolve the issue. Um, to resolve complaints, we often bring parties together to discuss what's going on and maybe do some negotiating when that's warranted. We also assist consumers with the grievance process when they choose to use it, um, as well as assisting with uh, appealing denials, both through internal plan appeal processes and um, hearings. And while ombudsmen don't represent clients at hearings, we do act as advocates and assist our clients in preparation for hearings and during those hearings. So you'll notice at the bottom of the slide here are top five complaints. Um, I will say that transportation um, is sometimes in the top five, sometimes they switch out a little bit, but in almost all cases, um, you will find a complaint about care coordination uh, in our work in my care. Um, wanted to give you just a couple of examples about um, uh, how we, you know, we would work through the process of receiving a complaint and what those are like. So an ombudsman might work with a person living in the community who doesn't know who their care manager is, it's pretty common and needs access to home health care. Um, the ombudsman would review what benefits the person has, explain to them how they might um, work with their care manager and how to access that person, also talk about the process of being evaluated to receive such benefits and what that looks like, and then really assist them through the process of contacting their care manager and hopefully getting services in place timely that the person is satisfied with. Uh, we certainly also help when Consumers um, have in-home care hours that have been cut as well. Um, we hear a lot about timely access to durable medical equipment and supplies. So, for example, a consumer requires a wheelchair or a hospital bed or a rollator and hasn't been successful in getting it through their care manager. And if you've ever worked with someone trying to get equipment, you know that um, it's a process-heavy endeavor requiring an awful lot of different parties and authorizations, and it's fairly easy to fumble along the way. When a consumer isn't receiving assistance, that can lead to slower provision of service and negative outcomes like skin breakdown or loss of functioning. So we find that sometimes care managers deny uh, without offering a formal notice of denial. Uh, thereby not providing consumers with information about their rights to appeal. And so um, we would assist with um, those instances as well. All right, next slide. Uh, we believe there are a number of reasons why our office is a good fit for this role in Ohio. Our program certainly has a strong history of providing excellent advocacy services to folks receiving long-term services and supports. And when determining what entity was the best Fit to serve my Care Ohio members, one benefit of our office was that, you know, that infrastructure had already been established. Not just the, um, you know, the physical and staffing components, those are important too, but also the complaint handling protocol, including that consent process, investigation and resolution techniques, and then staff that were already skilled in those areas as well. 
So what that means is that we were able to get up and running and provide services to MICARE members quickly. We also had long established relationships with a wide variety of stakeholders that were some of the same stakeholders we knew we'd be working with in the demonstration, like the Ohio Department of Medicaid and other state agencies, um, the area agencies on aging, and most importantly, consumers themselves. So, you know, in fact, many of the consumers that we now serve in my care were folks that we had served prior to. And finally, we had a history of effective systems advocacy. So sharing back with decision makers, what's impacting consumers and their loved ones. This is really an integral component of the demonstration work, contributing to the changes being made to ensure that our demonstration is operating as well as possible for MyCare Ohio members. Um, the picture here is uh, our office a couple of years ago, obviously pre-COVID, we're all very close uh, when Governor DeWine came to make a visit. Next slide. All right, so we also had a lot to learn and I promise you we continue to learn. Um, for example, while long-term care ombudsmen are experts in regulations specific to long-term services and supports, we had to and continue to learn about those um, impacting folks who aren't receiving such services. Understanding plan policies and procedures, how plans operate, these are incredibly important to the work of an ombudsman and we have found can change with frequency. So plans change their transportation vendors or the way they provide services to nursing home residents. Their processes for addressing grievances and appeals can be different and ever changing. So a lot of time and effort goes into tracking these things in the work that we do. Um, so we're sure that we're providing the best services possible. Um, in a program like ours, where this is a piece of the work we do, capturing population-specific data can take some time to perfect. Um, we might be working with a nursing home resident who wants to move back home with services in place without realizing that he's a MyCare member until too late in the game to involve a plan. Um, knowing how to do effective outreach um, is something we're still working on every day. It takes new approaches and a lot of trial and error. And finally, and I can't overstate this, we had to increase our relationship building and communication with partners, most specifically the plans. So we meet with them individually a few times a year to ensure that communication flows and that we know the right people to get in touch with at five o'clock on a Friday when there's an emergency. Next slide. All right, so just quickly to wrap up here, things that I think you should consider, obviously the population being served, what their unique needs are, um, uh, making sure that ombudsmen have access to decision makers and necessary information like plan policies and procedures. This has to be built in from the beginning. Um, the landscape in your state, what's it like? Um, what entities exist that might already be doing similar work and know the population you're trying to serve? And then please, please don't forget the funding. Ensuring that your ombudsman program is well-funded to meet the needs of consumers is really important. And without that increased funding to do um, the work, um, I just don't think um, that, you know, you're doing justice to um, the needs of consumers. So I will stop there. And just next slide has my contact information. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. That was, that was a great speedy but really good overview of um, what you do there and why it's so important. Um, so now we're going to switch over and hear from Jack Daly, who is uh, with the Ombudsman Program for the demonstration in California. So Jack, would you like to take it away? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, thank you to ICRC for hosting us and inviting us to come participate in this discussion. Really appreciate that. Um, next slide, please, Danny. Great. Um, so just to introduce myself again, Jack Daly. Um, I'm uh, employee of the Legal Aid Society of San Diego. I serve as the Director of Policy and Training internally within the Legal Aid Society of San Diego. Um, and we're the lead contract agency uh, for a statewide partnership uh, called the Health Consumer Alliance. This is a group of 10 legal aid uh, legal services nonprofits that have dedicated health consumer advocacy programs within within their their broader um, nonprofit civil legal services firms. Um, we banded together over 21 years ago um, to to really uh, focus on health law, broad 
uh, based cons um, health consumer advocacy, uh, develop expertise um, in, in those areas and advocate um, for consumers that uh, we anticipated would be uh, going through significant changes as uh, healthcare reform was taking hold, not only in California, but uh, in later years across the nation. So um, we have uh, significant experience in health law advocacy um, amongst our, our broad-based firms. Um, I give you that background because from, from that partnership, that statewide alliance um, uh, grows the CalMedic Connect Ombudsman Program. And the CalMedic Connect is the name of our uh, demonstration Medicare, uh, Medi-Cal program here in California. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll be chatting a little bit about our, our structure, um, some, some of the reasons and, and background on, on how this developed. Um, I'll then get into a little bit of the scope of our services um, and uh, how we how we play a role in partnership with both CMS and, and DHCS, the Department of Healthcare Services, our Medicaid agency, to provide them feedback and systems improvement information. And then I'll touch on some of the strengths of the model and, and some considerations of uh, for states that are considering adopting a similar model. Um, here, uh, just a, just a little bit more insight about the the the, the model itself and some additional background. So as, as noted, um, the the Department of Healthcare Services subcontracts out to the Legal Aid Society of San Diego uh, the CalMedic Connect Ombudsman role. So the Legal Aid Society of San Diego is the main contract agency. Uh, we in turn uh, subcontract out to distinct um, to our uh, HCA partners that have uh, coverage and representation and are locally based within the demonstration counties of the CalMedic Connect demonstration. The CalMedic Connect demonstration is in seven um, counties of California. The approximate enrollment at this point is about 114 or so thousand enrollees of the CalMedic Connect program. Uh, when the program started back in 2000. In 14, it was estimated that the potentially eligible CalMedic Connect population of dual eligibles was close to half a million um, uh, potential enrollees. Um, so the, the, to, to implement the CalMedic Connect program, the Legal Aid Society of San Diego subcontracts out to five partners um, in each, each of those counties. And each one of, as I noted before, each one of those partners is similarly situated to Legal Aid of San Diego. We each are located within broad-based civil legal service firms. We each have these dedicated health consumer centers, which are these broad-based consumer health consumer advocacy programs with years of experience um, serving uh, both public health coverage programs like the Medicaid program in California, since we like to name everything after our state, it's called Medi-Cal, um, uh, both the Covered California as well, which is the state's uh, exchange, Affordable Care Act exchange marketplace, um, as well as uh, county-based indigent um, care programs. Uh, more, moreover, our broad-based health consumer advocacy programs have experience in working with private insurance, employee-based insurance, um, really, any form of coverage or access to care barrier, our, our agencies are, are experienced in helping navigate on behalf of consumers. We have particular experience working with dual eligibles, of course, because that's a core part of our populations in our, and uh, even prior to the, the CalMedic Cal Connect program on Buzz and Roll. Um, and and have a particular experience working within each of our, our designated areas. Uh, so what, some of the reasons why I, I think our state went with a subcontracted model is, uh, for one, Legal Aid of San Diego and the Health Consumer Alliance have, have uh, had a long and, and successful partnership with other state agencies predating this, um, this project. Since 2012, we worked as the uh, Department of Managed Health Care's Consumer advocate um, for their consumer assistance program and similarly filled a role uh, when the Covered California Marketplace was created as a uh, consumer assistance program for Covered California beneficiaries as well. 
So kind of born out of that, of, of those existing relationships, when the state was um, considering implementing the demonstration here in California, there was a, a, one, a strong out, uh, out, outpouring of support for an independent and local ombuds program. And I give credit to, to the state and, and considering that feedback from all the stakeholders um, in, in adopting this model. But I think also too, the fact that we had been part of that, uh, the existing structure of, of uh, a consumer assistance program with the Department of Managed Healthcare in particular, um, was, was helpful. Initially, when the grant started, the Department of Healthcare Services subcontracted out its role to the Department of Manage, Managed Healthcare, um, and, and then the Department of Managed Healthcare uh, subcontracted that role to, to, our, to our offices. Um, it also makes sense given California's large geographic area, um, uh, each with culturally and linguistically distinct um, communities in each of those areas and in counties that are, are geographically non-contiguous. This is, uh, you know, California is a large state. We have 18 threshold languages throughout California. Um, each one of our regions has different threshold languages um, representing a, a threshold language in our state that represents at least 5% of the population um, whose primary language is, is, a, is, that, is a non-English language. And so it was incredibly important to have that local, um, that local voice, that local experience um, that with staff uh, of representative communities in each of these demonstration sites. Uh, next slide, please. So at the, it, within our CalMedic Connect Ombudsman Services Program, um, we offer a broad, a broad range of services and supports to our CalMedic Connect consumers and our CalMedic Connect eligible consumers. Um, uh, of course, individual um, education and advocacy to our members is at the core of our services. Um, we help folks navigate and access care within their plans. This can include everything from helping to dispute um, uh, delays or denials, reductions or terminations of care by, um, by the plan. Um, uh, at times, our members require out of network care where their needs um, exceed the, the capabilities or um, availability of providers within their networks. Uh, we, we help uh, members navigate continuity of care when they switch um, CalMedic Connect plans and, and or are enrolling into a CalMedic Connect plan for the first, first time. We also play a, a, an important part of the enrollment and, and disenrollment process, helping consumers navigate that process and overcoming barriers to enrollment. Um, and and in, that, in that capacity, we, um, we've been able to provide a lot of feedback to the state about uh, the enrollment process. In, in particular, in 2014, when the state um, uh, went live with the CalMedic Connect um, project, the enrollment and disenrollment barriers were, um, and, and issues identified by consumers were primary. Uh, we, we uh, each one of our offices experienced thousands and thousands of calls to consumer, uh, by consumers uh, asking us questions about the enrollment process that had begun in our state. And in, in, and in that, especially in that process, I think our, the fact that we were local and we were independent, we were not state employees, really helped build trust and credibility amongst our consumers. And, and, that, and, and I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, that as one of our strengths. So I wanted to flag that as, as particular in, in, in relating to the enrollment and disenrollment assistance we offer folks, because in, in particular, I recall consumers asking us, you're, uh, you're not a state employee, are you? And they, they you know, uh, I think in that moment, they were very emotional and frustrated and or scared about a change to their um, long established relationships with their Medicare providers. And they were concerned about the enrollment process. And so it was really great to one, build trust and, and credibility with the consumers and also be there to help explain the process, explain the benefits of the CalMedic Connect program and explain really their options and rights in that process. Um, we, we assist um, members uh, identify, uh, raise and um, uh, pursue grievances and appeals 
with, in, both internally within the plan and also with our external, um, in California, we have an external review available through the Department of Managed Healthcare, which is the regulatory agency with oversight uh, authority over managed care plans. Um, and uh, it, really importantly, as Teresa noted, care coordination is, a, is a, always a huge concern for our consumers, uh, both uh, to help consumers identify who their care coordinator is and it, during um, important transitions of their care, including LTSS care, um, ensuring that the care coordinator is engaging appropriately and providing um, and necessary supports to members in that process. Um, very often during our, our, the last six years of our um, work as ombudsman for the Comet Connect program, uh, billing issues and problems rose to the top of our problem list uh, in our reporting. Um, very often this happened where uh, longtime Medicare providers uh, were unfamiliar with uh, working with dual eligible consumers. And um, it was a real education process for our advocates and uh, to engage those uh, providers and educate them about the, the billing prohibitions under the Medicaid program in California called Medi-Cal and for qualified Medicare beneficiaries. Um, uh, and really importantly in, in, in our experience in the, in the California um, CalMedic Connect Ombudsman was our role serving uh, eligibility concerns and issues for our consumers. Uh, we have long been um, uh, voicing the concern that eligibility churn or uh, eligibility problems are access to care issues for our consumers. Um, we, our, in, uh, our consumers face annual redeterminations or redeterminations, obviously, when there's any change in their uh, Medi-Cal eligibility and uh, found very often that consumers were learning about their um, ineligibility for Medi-Cal and also their termination from their Comedic Connect plan when they were seeking care or when they were uh, um, going to fill a prescription at a pharmacy. And that often would happen weeks or months after the built-in deeming protections um, uh, uh, had expired. And so uh, our, we, viewed our, we took our role certainly very seriously with regards to our work with the, the county eligibility offices to resolve eligibility problems as expeditiously as possible to avoid um, unnecessary disruptions of care and, um, and uh, ensure that they were uh, put back into the Medi-Cal program as soon as possible. Um, and then finally, I'll note that uh, one of the, the, the benefits of, of our co-location within legal service providers offices is uh, our ability to holistically screen to, to promote these internal referrals to our other legal teams, as well as other external referrals to those supports and services that um, help address social determinants of health. Um, it, one of the, I'll, I'll get into, actually I'll get into examples in some later slides about um, how, that, how that comes into play, but that, that is, a, is a key part of our intake process. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's uncommon that we find an interaction with a CalMedic Connect beneficiary that doesn't result with some form of other referral, uh, referral either internally or externally. Next slide. The, the, uh, we, we really build our, our advocacy for over two decades now um, uh, on the idea that we help individuals resolve their individual cases and problems, but we want, we, uh, with the goal of, of aggregating the lessons learned and bubbling that up so that we can make systems change and inform the systems that help administer these programs to make improvements. And that really has been a, a, an excellent model for our, our Health Consumer Alliance um, over the years, but also certainly within the context of the CalMedic Connect Ombudsman program. So we, we have regular communications and provide regular feedback to, Cal, um, to the CMS and ACL, to uh, DHCS, our Medi-Cal agency. Uh, we meet regularly also with the Department of Managed Healthcare as well. Um, as I mentioned, they have a regulatory oversight all, of all the Medi-Cal plans in California. Um, we meet with our county eligibility departments on a regular basis. We, we meet with our CalMedic Connect plans on a regular basis. We um, 
we all participate in the advisory groups um, that our plans uh, host and uh, those relationships have proved to be very um, fruitful with the CalMedic Connect plans directly. And in addition, we, we connect with local networks and providers, for example, have a strong relationship with the hospital association um, in, and also the clinic networks here in, in San Diego County. And that has uh, been in, uh, um, very helpful in the course of our assistance to consumers navigating, navigating care. Um, the, I've offered some examples of some of the feedback that we've provided over the years to um, both DHCS and the CMS and ACL about the experiences of, experiences of our consumers. I mentioned um, eligibility churn and the impact on access to care for members. And uh, in, in, based on those experiences, our programs were integral in escalating um, uh, issues and insights about deeming and the deeming policies that were being formed. Initially, our state rolled out a 30-day deeming period, but um, in strong correlation with the, uh, the feedback we've offered about uh, how deeming policies in effect impact members and the timing for which members are typically learning of eligibility issues, uh, the state had agreed to expand that to 60 days in most of our counties and even 90 days in, in one of our demonstration sites. Um, we also provide improvements to the whole state enrollment um, process. Uh, we're all constantly providing feedback about the enrollment um, broker partner and their role in um, enrolling or disenrolling members. And so identifying uh, training and additional um, improved messaging for the staff of that enrollment broker. And finally, um, offering best practices and feedback on D the provision of DME services. Uh, our, our programs participated really heavily in that process. And I, and I failed to mention earlier in, I apologize in the identification of our structure. And um, it'd be, it's really important to mention here on this slide regarding our feedback uh, uh, for assistance improvement, uh, that we also subcontract out to Justice and Aging as our technical assistance partner and the staff at Justice and Aging, uh, which is a national nonprofit, really leaders in advocacy for older adults and, and have been uh, just incredible in helping us to uh, escalate issues, uh, formulate um, our, our feedback and provide us ongoing technical assistance and support so that we are uh, stay on top of the, the many changes that happen. Uh, both in, in uh, the administration of these programs, the guidance coming out of the agency and changes on the federal level as well. So just as an aging is a huge part of our ability to provide that feedback to the state and to CMS. Next slide. The, um, I, I'm, I think I'm running a little short on time. So I'm just gonna go through these relatively quick here, quickly here, but um, the, some of the strengths I've already touched on, but the, being a local and independent advocate proved very helpful uh, at immediately gaining the trust of our of our consumers when we started back in 2014. Again, that was during the enrollment phase, and so there was a lot of concern amongst consumers, um, and uh, consumers had a lot of questions about what was happening with their healthcare. And being able to contact an agency, many uh, you know consumers immediately asked if we were part of the state uh, or. Uh, or not, and I think they took some some comfort in the idea that we were an independent organization. Um, we're, we're we're being locally based in the in the community uh, with a history of ties is has also been helpful. Most of our programs have been in existence for uh, forty years or more in our communities, and so this um, you know we have established ties locally recognized and. Um, uh, and it, that, that has proven very beneficial to ensuring that um, our, our local partners, the local plans, the providers are all familiar with who we are and what our role is. Um, as I mentioned previously, we're, we're, uh, we have the experience of, of health law staff within these legal aid entities, uh, both non-attorney non advocates and attorney, um, attorneys fill, the, fill these roles. And um, it, uh, our, our staff is, is com comprised of 
of staff that um, are representative of uh, the very diverse uh, communities that we serve. Um, I mentioned earlier 18 threshold languages across the state. Uh, this has proven really important to um, our outreach efforts as well. Um, having, uh, for example, a staff uh, in the Bay Area of uh, Santa Clara County uh, speak Vietnamese uh, was, was really helpful in our outreach effort. We uh, have a, a staff person there who participates in a monthly Vietnamese radio spot to talk about CalMeta Connect program and about the issues that consumers face. And that's a a widely under, uh, understood and, and identified program in the local Vietnamese community. In Orange County, we have co um, uh, native Korean speakers that are uh, key in engaging the local community. In, um, in San Diego, we have Arabic uh, speaking advocates that help us engage those distinct populations. So having that representation um, it, within the community helps on identifying not only the, the consumers, but also the providers that serve those co consumers. And then the co-location within legal services offices, again, I, I just want to touch on that briefly. We, we holistically screen all of our callers for a, a broad range of issues they may be facing. And, you know, so much of what we do, um, uh, you know, to help someone access a care need they have uh, help ensure that their, their eligibility for the program is maintained, their enrollment is maintained, is really only touching on a part of the challenge that our members face. Um, when we screen our members, we often are finding that our members are, are facing um, challenges in their living arrangements. They may have uh, unsafe uh, living circumstances. They may be facing eviction. They may have food insecurity, income insecurity, um, they, may, they may have concerns about debt, they may be being harassed by collection agencies, um, or maybe have been taken advantage of and, and were subject to um, a form of financial abuse um, and, and um, subject to fraud or other, other forms of, of, uh, of concerns that can be addressed uh, you know, through consumer law protections. And so, Every one of those issues I just identified can be addressed within the, the with internal referrals to our partners within our legal services programs. Our, we have housing teams, um, immigration law teams, consumer law teams. Um, we have broad-based government benefit teams that assist with um, SNAP benefits and uh, SSI benefits and a variety of different supports for consumers. Next slide. For those states considering adopting this, this model of subcontracting out to advocacy partners in the community, um, one of the things that I, I think Nancy touched on this is uh, breaking down silos within the agency is really important. We, we um, uh, are aware that some of our ombudsman partners across the nation within the different de de demonstration sites had, um, especially those that were state employed, had access to uh, beneficiary information, so Medicaid beneficiary information, including their 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 addresses, and this was in, this was important for um, those ombudsman programs to be able to conduct outreach and direct mailing programs to those members. Um, with a subcontracted model, there's understandably some more um, uh, limits on what information can be shared directly with our agencies. By, this, by our state Medicaid agency, Department of Healthcare Services. Um, they uh, are, are um, so that, that could be something that, that programs want to consider. Um, but it is really important that, uh, and, and I think DHCS is, is a model for this, that, that there was a great commitment on their part to um, uh, being open and committed to um, feedback from the consumer advocacy community and inviting us into uh, regular meetings with a variety of their departments to help break down those some of those those silos um, and help us escalate issues and provide systems feedback and so I give great credit to DHCS um, for um, for maintaining that openness 
And I think that really, uh, for other states considering this model, they have to really kind of look internally and to be ready to accept that feedback and partner with um, external agencies uh, for the, the betterment of the overall project and the delivery of the service to, to consumers. Um, with that, I think I can wrap up. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so this is my contact information and also the, the contract manager, Ariana Tover, at the DHCS, our main contact on our, on our contract. Um, appreciate the opportunity to uh, present today. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jack. That was a great tour through all that you do out there in California for demonstration and rules. And I think really shows the depth of um, what an ombudsman program can really do. Um, so let's move, uh, Jenny, if you could move to the next slide. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of a change up here and do a, a, a sort of a panel discussion with Melinda Elwood and Dustin Welch, who are respectively from um, Mass Health in Massachusetts and the Department of Health and Human Services in South Carolina. Um, just a tiny little bit of background before we get into that. So Massachusetts, uh, their demonstration is called One Care, and their ombudsman uh, is the uh, My Ombudsman program. The One Care demonstration enrolls duly eligible individuals under the age of 65. So these are uh, younger people, primarily with disabilities. And in South Carolina, uh, their demonstration, Healthy Connections Prime, enrolls individuals who are over the uh, age 65 and over. So this is a, uh, an older population of duly eligible individuals. So slightly different uh, uh, approaches. Massachusetts follows uh, the same sort of model as California. So it contracts with a nonprofit organization to run the My Ombudsman program, and that is the Disability Policy Consortium. In South Carolina, they operate their demonstration ombudsman through their uh, Office of Aging. And so um, with that little bit of background, Dan, if you move to the next slide for me, we just have a couple of questions for Melinda and Dustin. So let's start off and talk a little bit about the value add that the demonstration ombudsman programs bring. And so Melinda, let's start with you. Can you talk about what the greatest value add that the My Ombudsman program brings to your demo? Sure. Hi, everybody. This is Melinda Elwood. I'm so um, grateful to be here and, and share some of our experience with you. Um, I think and I just want to clarify one thing, you know, our uh, demonstration program or our ombudsman program is very similar to California. I think one significant difference is that our ombudsman program are not, they are not attorneys, so they are not representing individuals in appeals and grievances. Um, so it's a slightly different model there and, and they are also not subcontracting out, it's just one organization. So just a couple of clarifications. But in terms of the greatest value add-on, I wanna emphasize that first and foremost is the value that they bring to our members. I think having an independent resource to resolve member complaints and concerns and answer questions, you know, that is a value to the state as well as our members because our interest is ultimately in ensuring that our members get access to the care and services that they need. So that would be number one. I think the other values that I would echo in terms of things that Jack and Teresa said would be, you know, it's incredibly valuable, I think, to a state agency to have this insight into how your program is functioning very specifically from the member perspective. You know, we can only go so far in terms of contract management and the reporting that we require, but to really get a window into what it's like for one of our members to be navigating a conflict within one of our plans um, is, is just incredibly valuable. It, it can demonstrate both the challenges and the successful parts of a model. And I think that's incredibly critical. Um, so two pieces there, I think one is again, the actual member experience, two is you know program and plan performance. And the last way would be that, that it's also another way that we can communicate changes to our members. So we certainly do noticing, our plans do noticing, but you know, when we're going through something significant like a challenge or vaccination or, or whatever it is that we're experiencing, being able to also use the ombudsman as a resource for those kinds of initiatives, I think is, is incredibly helpful too. Great, thank you, Melinda. And um, Dustin, really same question to you. How about um, value add there? Okay, Nancy, thank you. So again, thank you for inviting me to present today and speak with you guys. I very much uh, enjoyed this, this, this kind of thing. 
So for, for us in our demonstration here in South Carolina, we have focused, as you, as you stated for the group, that you know we work with the senior population and the care needs that come along with that. And I think one of the biggest and kind of best value adds that our ombudsman program, we call them the prime advocate, they're a neutral third party. So they're not, they're not agency DHHS staff. They are in the, uh, kind of a neutral pl you know, player in the game so that we have a kind of a voice for the folks who are asking questions to determine if our program is valid and we're not a scam and all the other kind of rumors that, that people hear for our vulnerable population being the senior folks, um, having that extra kind of support system and value system to help support the message and ensure that what we are you know, presenting and offering to them is a valid program and is a is a potential option for them with you know kind of an unbiased opinion of that. I think that's one of the best things that we have is consistency and information and, and a support from a group that's not me as an agency employee and not one of our health plans trying to you know, gain enrollment, but a person who is who is here to talk about the benefits and protections and this and the safety nets things that are in there for them uh, for the members who are potentially interested in our program. I think that's been one of the best things. For, for our experience with our senior population, with our prime advocate folks. Great, thank you. It's so, it's so important that the beneficiary feels like they have somebody who can really level with them and provide them good good information, so important. Um, Jack, uh, in, in a couple of his slides, he talked about some of the the issues that uh, their work has has uncovered that they have been able to work with the states and the plans out in California to make some changes to uh, the CalMedi Connect demonstration. And just wondered if you can both uh, talk to how the um, involvement of your ombudsman and, and the data and issues that they, they bring to light have helped you to refine or improve the demonstrations in your state. So, so now, um, Dustin, do you want to go first on that one? Sure, we're glad to. So having our, our prime advocate, our ombudsman program kind of work with the members in the community, uh, it really helps us to stay on top of trending issues and trending topics and things that they're hearing. Again, if it's, if it's some type of mailer fraud issue they're hearing about, or if it's some type of other, um, Kind of opportunity where seniors could be taken advantage of and they're learning about these things in the community and working with members they bring it to us in turn in discussion and help us to identify that for both our our federal partners at cms as well as our health plans and it helps us to kind of make sure that our messaging and things that we're producing for members and kind of informational material is is branded as such that it's recognized in things that are um you know, easily identifiable as valid information um and just e even fast forwarding to today and hearing kind of some of the concerns with the vaccinations and, and you know folks who may get a vaccine in a hospital versus a nursing home and making sure that that consistent information relates to the plans so that you know we are paying attention to those topics and trends just things you know things of that nature that help us to continue to think about things besides policy administration but what's going on in the community and in in our current world of the pandemic and things of that nature helping us stay on top of any other things that can create confusion for our population and how to better message for them Great, thank you. And and Melinda, as you answer this question, could you also describe a little bit about how um, the ombudsman in Massachusetts participates in your um, your uh, implementation council there? So sorry, folks, I was yeah. muted. <laughs> Let me start over with that. Um, so yeah, to draw upon that, Nancy, I'll just take a step back and say, so we have in Massachusetts, as many demonstrations do, our ombudsman program, and then we have something that we refer to as the Implementation Council. Um, in Massachusetts, that Implementation Council is a procured body, and we have several, and it consists of advocates, providers, and in, and in particular, which I think is a really important component, we must have at least 51% consumer representation on that uh, council. And so the uh, One Care Ombudsman presents on a quarterly basis, I think as many of these ombudsman programs do, to the Implementation Council. And the council a couple years ago also voted to have the ombudsman, the director of our ombudsman program, sit at the table. Uh, so they are technically you know, part of the council, although they are not a non-voting member. And so going back to this question about sort of things that have changed, 
you know, when we uh, underwent kind of a, a scrubbing of our contract a few years back, um, I think it was in 2019 or so, we had both the Implementation Council and the One Care Ombudsman kind of go through the contract and highlight some places that they, caught, they thought could be strengthened. And we um, made, you know, pretty explicit changes as a result of those discussions. And one thing that I think the Ombudsman in particular was really helpful in highlighting for us is that you know, we were hearing a lot about member confusion with respect to thinking that they had asked for a particular service or a particular benefit, and then never getting any kind of formalized denial or, or not understanding where that request had sort of gone to. And so we really added some, some language to our three-way contract a few years back to really strengthen, we added a definition, first of all, for service requests and sort of strengthen the requirements around documentation to make that really clear. So that's, that's just one example. Um, and one thing I would add here is that I do think it is important to have the ombudsman uh, sort of going the other direction as well. So on the one hand, they do bring issues to our attention. And similarly, when the council or other stakeholders bring issues to our attention as a state, we can then go back to the ombudsman and say, hey, you know, have you seen any of these examples or can you, can you provide some more explicit information here in terms of the cases that you've dealt with where you could illustrate for us what may be happening? And so I do think having multiple avenues for stakeholder and member input, including an ombudsman whose specific function is really problem resolution um, is critical. That's a, such a great point because you, you have that ombudsman actually being able to verify information for you and, and let you know if, if, uh, if what's being reported to you is, is a larger issue, which is great. Um, and just wanted to re, uh, remind uh, our attendees that we will have some uh, time for Q&A. We're going to 1.45 this afternoon. So if uh, this discussion is starting to prompt some questions in your mind, please uh, go ahead and, and use the Q&A feature and, and uh, send those questions to us. Um, and so we talked uh, a little bit about value and value to consumers or things that both of you mentioned. And Thinking about the role of ombudsman in, in Medicaid managed care programs more broadly, particularly for programs that are enrolling individuals with complex needs, uh, not just duly eligible individuals. Um, what are some of the values that ombudsman programs would have for that broader population? You know, um, Melinda, do you wanna maybe speak to that one first? Sure, sure. So uh, here in Massachusetts, we did start out with the ombudsman program exclusively serving our dual, uh, our dual population. And so that would be the folks who were enrolled in our demonstration program. And, and again, that's that population that's under age 65, the, dis the, the members with disabilities. Um, and we decided a couple of years back to uh, expand the role of the ombudsman to serve not only our managed care enrollees in the demonstration, but every single managed care enrollee uh, under the Mass Health program is now able to access our ombuds services. And I think, you know, the advantages are very similar to what I said before. You know, it's, it's basically another resource for consumers, you know, who feel like, and I think somebody, Dustin, may have made this point earlier, that there's some sort of independent check on whatever it is that they're experiencing with their plan. Um, that they can go to for a resource. So I think, you know, emphasizing again that the value of independence. And I think it's also, again, um, you know, a way to, when you think about managed care as a concept, it's sort of removing some of the function of Medicaid and, and sort of putting that onto plans, a different entity other than the state. And so, you know, by definition, that's like one step removed from the state work on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I think especially in those situations, it's important to have an ombudsman there to, again, kind of provide those eyes and ears on the ground to what's happening in terms of uh, access to care for our members through the plans. So I think the values, again, are very similar in the sense that it's a resource for members. It is a way for the state to understand how the programs function from a member perspective. It's another way to look at performance um, and again, be the, the eyes and ears of the community and, and sort of helping us to understand any issues that may be percolating. Great. Dustin, any thoughts to add to that? Yeah, thank you, Nancy. Now I will echo Melinda's statements here. Um, have, you know, our, our, again, our, our, our population focuses on the senior folks in the senior groups of our, of our current demographic. And uh, many of our studies show that these individuals have at least two or more comorbidities so having that um, prime advocate or that, that ombudsman team to help support member kind of inquiries and questions 
having having them there to help a person to navigate the the care continuum that we offer um, who's already having other issues of their own I think that that's the the underscoring value that they bring is having a neutral party and someone to kind of help the member make choices um, you know about their care and can and to continuing to give them as much independence as possible while giving them a resource of, of comfort and truth to know that the information they're receiving is true and is valid is coming from a neutral source versus any other kind of swaying source or influential source. And I think that's a, a very big part of our, our support system with them. Great, thank you. So um, Melinda already, already mentioned this, but in Massachusetts, they have um, expanded the scope of the ombudsman to uh, go beyond just the demonstration and it really now incorporating all of their Medicaid managed care populations. South Carolina uh, is thinking and, and working towards expanding its dual uh, demonstration to cover uh, a larger, so in the covering the um, duly eligible individuals under age 65 as well as those over. And so um, Dustin, maybe you can just talk for a minute about how you are thinking about the ombudsman program in the context of this uh, shift in the demonstration population and what what is going to be really important for you to keep within that ombudsman structure going forward and if you've thought about how you're going to need to maybe refine the ombudsman program a little bit to serve that broader population. I think uh, that's, a, that's an excellent question, Nancy, and you, you are correct. We are we are here in South Carolina considering expanding our population to, to the dual eligibles who are 21 and older. And in that, we expect to have experiences with more caregivers being involved in the conversation, just like we have today. We're expecting um, members to be more involved in their care choices and being more um, kind of curious and inquisitive about the programs. So I think that the ombudsman role today is just as important for the younger population that we're looking to serve um, as it is the older population by having that kind of neutral source of information, neutral source of protections. Um, I think maybe Jack mentioned it a moment ago, but you know we, we've had the ongoing battle with balance billing and, and member billing issues along the way. That comes to, to mind as members who are um, currently not in our demographic may, be, may begin accessing care in our program and then and thus providers having experience with the, with the Healthy Connections Prime program, having questions, having issues, having concerns, but having again that, that the historic knowledge now and historic kind of connection with the prime, the prime advocate or ombudsman program for South Carolina. I think you know, introducing those members, those potential members to that support system will be very, very pivotal um, should issues arise. So I think having that support system they offer and the methodologies and the ways they support members and support the agency as, as they do, I think, I think those things will be very um, pivotal for us as we move forward in making these decisions. Good, great, great point. Melinda, how about you? Um, what uh, what did you uh, need to tweak a little bit as you expanded the role of the ombudsman? So um, a couple of things I would say. One is um, just so folks are clear on our process. At the time when we did, so we had the one care ombudsman who had always, you know, since the beginning of one care been served exclusively by the, the disability policy consortium has served in that role. And then when we moved, um, you know, both as a result of timing and when we moved to serve a broader population, we did uh, re-procure. So we did a formal re-procurement to ask, you know, who wanted to serve the population. And we ended up uh, selecting the Disability Policy Consortium again to serve our members. And so we were able to do a lot of thinking, you know, sort of collectively with them and, and really kind of responded to their thoughts about how to restructure the program. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a, bigger population, a larger population, potentially a more diverse population. So there's a learning curve there. But, you know, I think a lot of the discussions were around, you know, staffing and managing um, new training, thinking through outreach, because it's a much uh, broader number of members and actually uh, broader across the state in terms of the, the various counties that we serve through our, our managed care programs outside of one care. And then also thinking about um, data collection and tracking, sort of a little bit more nuanced in how you're going to manage those systems. But I think overall, it was a relatively seamless transition from a program's point of view. I think we continue to um, 
look for new ways to do outreach to members um, because it is a, a little bit newer of a program as opposed to the one care population who has you know been working with the ombudsman for for quite a few years now right right um so we're we're coming down to our last few minutes uh do you have any advice to uh state medicaid agencies your colleagues out there with regard to uh, building ombudsman programs for for their complex populations Yes, yeah, sorry, would you like me to answer first? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. I said, yeah. Um, sure, absolutely. We, uh, a lot of input. And I, I just want to stress too, for any folks or states who are out there considering ombudsman programs, please feel free to, um, I'll provide my contact information to Nancy and others. So feel free to get in touch. I think a few things come to mind. One is, you know, get that community input and the buy-in from the very beginning. And I think Jack talked about this a little bit in California, you know, ask your members what they would like to see in an ombudsman program, you know, look to them them to give you information about the different kinds of models you know that are available and, and what might work best for their communities so I think that's really important both from um, you know the, the development of the structure itself and also to kind of create this buy-in and, and and feeling that this is going to be a useful source for them that they will then rely on when it becomes um, available I think ensuring the commitment from the agency uh, and your plans to bi-directional communication, and that includes, you know, a commitment to sharing program and policy information, a commitment to working with the ombudsman, and, you know, specifically with the plans, I think it's important to have contract language that outlines specifically the responsibility of the plans uh, to work with your ombudsman teams, and then also a commitment to you know, hearing feedback back from the ombudsman and, you know, thinking through how you're going to use that or manage that. Um, and that includes, you know, pathways for addressing what could be really urgent um, cases. And then I think last would be really thinking through in advance your expectations and goals around data tracking and reporting and public reporting. Um, I think those are all really uh, critical things to think about. Great, thank you. Uh, Dustin, advice? Yeah, sure. And I'll be, I'll attempt to be brief here. I, I agree with uh, I agree with Melinda's points there as well. Um, she kind of stole my thunder on that one a little bit, but I think for our experience is having, um, always having our ombudsman team, you know, seated at our table in, in, in terms of policy decisions and discussions, kind of getting their buy-in, their way in and their, and their thoughts on um, anything as we, as we progress through our demonstration years. Um, you know, we have a relatively rigorous uh, monthly meeting schedule with all of our health plans here in South Carolina. We have a ongoing schedule, meeting schedule with CMS and, our prime advocate, our ombudsman team, they're they're a part of those conversations. They're they're a they're a, a entity at the table with us, bringing agenda items you to our attention or for discussion. Um, having them involved as much as we can, and so that we are giving them current real time information. They're you know obviously providing sender receiver feedback as as issues arrive arise. I think having you know having everyone to hear the same thing and communicate the same things to the community collectively has been a very big part of that as well. So you know we. Even while they're not a health plan, they are a very big part of our program. And in, in, in by the way of that, and just sort of supporting members and hearing the kind of the um, just the overall message and, the, and so that they know real time firsthand kind of what we're doing, where we're going and hearing, you know, from you know, from our different plans and partners um, on how we kind of navigate that that member experience as a collective program. We, we you know, they're not they're not on an island by themselves. They're not you know separate from our plans. They're not separate from the agency. We're all kind of one big team in this effort in South Carolina. And having them, you know, part of as a part of our our team basically is 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 very important to us as far as success goes with our membership experience. Thank you. That's really really great advice. Um, can we get to the next slide, please? Uh, okay, so we're going to obviously skip over the question and answer. Uh, next slide. So our brief uh, will be available later on this afternoon, I believe, at the link that you see there on your screen. And we've also provided uh, contact information for all of our presenters today. And I do want to thank them, uh, Melinda and Dustin and Teresa and Jack. Great, great information, really valuable. Um, we will be, again, posting a recording of the webinar and the slides on the ICRC website. We'll also be sending that out to all of you by email. Um, I wanna thank our partners at CMS for uh, their support of the Integrated Care Resource Center and to all of you for participating today. 
And as you log out today, please uh, take a minute and complete the evaluation survey. Thank you all very much and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks. Bye-bye.